I'm Jeremy Black. Uh, I was born in London in 1955. Um, I was educated there. Um, I went to university, to Cambridge, in fact, in 1975, graduated in 1978 with a starred first, went to Oxford, uh, moved on to Durham in 1980, was successively lecturer, senior lecturer, reader and professor, very dull to the end of 95, moved to Exeter, where I uh, had the senior chair in history from 96 till I retired at the beginning of 2020. And I'm now writing books, including the book we're going to be talking about and have written rather a lot of books. And um, I would like to commend the one we're talking about, but there are others for people to read as well. I wanted to write it because I wanted to write what I call crossover history and crossover history is history in which you're writing for the general audience, but you're illuminating it with archival work and the benefits of understanding the strengths and ambiguities of evidence, because unfortunately there tends to be sort of a, often a gap in the in history between people specialists writing for specialists what I call telephone kiosk history where you can fit everybody in the world who'd be interested in a telephone kiosk and on the other hand popular history which tends to unfortunately there are some good popular historians but all too often it's uh, very uncritical in its use of sources and really lacks any broader contextualization so I was trying to uh, to tackle that. And of course, my background in part is not just that I'm a military historian, but I'm also a historian of 18th century Britain and a historian of 18th century Europe, have published important books uh, on all three. And therefore, it was an opportunity to look for links and relationships in this broader context. Well, I think my book differs on existing works on the topic, A, because it comes from a general military historian with broader perspectives. So in other words, you've got people in the past who've written about British military history and they've compared British generals with other British generals, which is fine. But actually, what's more interesting is to compare them with other generals of the period. So when I'm commenting on French generals of the period, I'm doing so from a perspective of somebody who's written a book on, you know, France as a great power in that period. So that gives you a broader perspective perspective. And also, if you're writing it, having written more generally on Britain in the 18th century, you understand the strengths and weaknesses of the governmental system. You understand the political pressures that are at stake. So you're not simply looking at it from a military perspective. I mean, if you were to look at, for example, the Peninsular War from Wellington's correspondence, you would think that he was being held back by ignorant politicians and ministers in London who had no understanding of what was going on. Whereas actually, if you read their correspondence, Correspondence, you can appreciate that Wellington is just part of a context of fiscal, military and political considerations, all of which they have to try and keep in balance. Establishing the global empire, I would say the pivotal war is the Seven Years' War, what um, Americans uh, would call the French and Indian War, but the British date it from 1756 to 1763. And that war sees Britain end up as the uh, prime European power in North America and the prime European power in South Asia. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't local uh, you know, forces that are significant, particularly in India, but it's the prime European power. And thereafter, um, nobody, despite the French and Spanish effort in the, um, the War of American Independence and the efforts made in the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, nobody is going to knock Britain off that pedestal. So, I mean, Britain thereafter remains the strongest European power externally, really until the ebb of empire in the late 20th century. Well, I think um, broad range capability is more important than particular platforms. So in other words, one of the things I try to argue in my book is that the British military is so impressive because it handles both um, sorry, it handles across a wide range, uh, insurrection in the British Isles, um, fighting uh, regular warfare uh, on the continent of Europe, 
uh, fighting European powers outside Europe, fighting non-European powers across a broad range from North America to Asia. And that this gives it a particular um, um, multifaceted capability and experience. Um, I think today sometimes people um, put too much emphasis on the weaponry, the kit, and not the training and experience in operating in many different contexts. And I think the latter is really significant. people will find the book interesting. I think in particular, uh, what many readers will find fascinating is I've tried to, qu to quote extensively from original sources of the material of the period. And I've got some, I think, really quite good ones there so that you get a flavour of what conflict was like, as well as considering the broader questions of strategic uh, development and political needs and requirements. So I hope people find this a, a a book which seeks to cover the broad range that the British Army did so well in covering in that period.